uh, to the overcrowding task force committee meeting. Uh, today we're going to have uh, a presentation by SSP Architects. Gene and Heather are here from the company. They're going to go through what they have found out with all the information we gave them from the committee, from both the town side and the school side. Uh, they looked at many different things, many different items that we presented to them and gave them. So uh, I'm going to let them do the presentation tonight. And at the end, write down any questions you have. I'm sure either they or we will answer the questions. But I just want to uh, recognize a couple of people first that put this together. Judy Cox, thank you very much for getting this all together. Mr. Mashad, Joey Shi, our board president is in presence. Our uh, board member elect, Liz Conway, is here and uh, our union president, uh, Jeff Bowden, and obviously superintendent, Dr. Dr. Sa Mr. Saxton. Paul, he, he hates when I call him Paul, uh, Mr. Saxton because it makes him feel young. So, yeah, yeah. He's handing out senior cards, so in case anyone is 60 and over or like a senior card, you may get one. All right, thank you very much. Good evening, Jean Parentoni, SSP Architects, and I echo the welcome that Ralph just said. And I'm really pleased that to come tonight because what this is is more of a preview and really an explanation of the process that we're in rather than it being something that I'm delivering you know, news and, and late breaking news. It's really early in the process, but the idea was to reconvene the overcrowded overcrowding committee because you already know that there is a capacity need in the district. You've already had exposure to the information in the past. And part of what our job now with the long range facility plan update is to confirm what has happened over the past five years and what is predicted to happen over the next five years, which includes absorbing all the students that have been already absorbed into the schools and what the impact on facilities has been, as well as what's going to happen from this point on. And that's really the purpose of, of tonight, is to give you that overview. And you can see that this agenda is fairly short and straightforward. I hope at some point we really open it up for input, since I look at you as an advisory group, um, the, looking to, to make sure that what I'm studying in the next couple of months really is on point. Um, I'll do an introduction with, with Heather coming here. I'm going to talk about the, the planning process and what all the component parts are. And then in terms of our preliminary findings and some of the things that I'm putting on the table that will be incorporated into the second part of the, uh, the planning process, that's where I'll be looking for input from you and comments, as well as giving you a kind of a big picture timeline as to what all the steps are moving forward from this point on. Jean Parentoni, uh, my credentials as a, um, I'm an architect, I'm also an educational facility planner, an accredited one, which is actually only one of three in the state of New Jersey, and that's through an international organization. Um, with me is Heather Wilkinson, who's going to be our project manager, and she's really spearheading the team that's been looking at the infrastructure systems. So all the walls, ceilings, roofs, all those components, that's part of the long-range picture is not only capacity, but all this, so the infrastructure. And then back in the office that's doing a lot of the analysis and he'll be very involved with the budget estimating is Scott Mahalik, who's another principal with me at SSP, and he really is the guy that, that helps us really determine when we're looking at priorities and really figuring out what needs to happen when in terms of first, second, third, and those kind of orders, he's, he takes the analysis approach with that. What I wanted to make sure that everyone, the district has a district um, vision. It has talking about education. There's also a corresponding part for facilities because the facilities are meant to serve the education. The idea of a facility's mission is that the educational activities, the programs, the events, the community use has to happen and follow what the district wants it to do. And that includes the community input, the judgment of the Board of Education, as well as all the input from the staff, the school principals, all the supervisors, all the people that are really involved in the day-to-day -day operations. We want to make sure that, that it's done in an 
energy efficient, sustainable manner, and really that allows for the education to happen. And of course, that's changing with the 21st century. So we're talking about you know, the remote student learning, which is a lot of self-directed learning, discovery, and achievement. That's really what the end result is. So our measure of good facilities is not the pretty picture, but it's how successful it's really um, holding the programs and, and performing for the district. There is something I start with, which is the universal objectives, because these are components which I don't even ask your opinion about. These are things that are the baseline for any long-range facility master plan. These schools have to achieve these components. One is that they have to be safe and secure, and they have to be kind of healthy environments. That's a given. Doesn't, the school's not working at its top um, high-performance standards if it's not doing that. In addition, it has to be relevant and promoting the education. If it's not you know, pro-education, it's also not functioning as a school. Then the component of what the community really wants to see in their schools, what they value, um, that really is part of what because of, in a public school system, you're self-taxing yourself. So what the community is willing to self-tax themselves for is a component part of the vision of it. The schools have to fit within their sites and their environs in terms of how the pickup, drop-off, access to it works out, how the stormwater management is happening, things that, that really are the basic streamlines to the operation sides the school has to function. And then also, what can we do to make it so that the schools cost less to run? Because if we can make schools cost less to run, that money can be geared towards programs that can go into the classroom, not into the building. So we're really cognizant in terms of our planning is to think long team, long term and strategic in terms of making the schools operate at less money, energy related as well as kind of year round use functions. These are the components that I really as the long range planner for the, the um, for our firm really get very much involved in. And I just want to really just point out, which is probably kind of uh, self-evident, but there's really three main components of any kind of long-range plan, whether it's for schools or for any kind of uh, facility. One is you start with whatever bones of the, the buildings that you have. You know, you have these, these buildings that have existing capacities, they have different functions, they have different surfaces. We take a look at what is existing, because that's your existing resources. That's, what you're, that's your starting point with what you have. And there might be needs, priorities that go with that with, in term, terms of keeping them operating at a high level, but that's a starting point. Then what they have to do is they have to hold the number of students that are coming not only in the schools right now, but that are projected to come. So you have the enrollment growth, you have the demographic changes, you have other components that are really related to the capacity issues, and that's really obviously a really big part of it. Part of our process is having the district's demographer, uh, George Sundell from Sundance Associates, is doing a new projection. So the, all that's been renewed, and that report is going to be done in a couple of weeks. It's, it's really in the process of being renewed right now. And that's a critical component, because before I can do all my diagrams and give you all numbers and tell you about exactly what the need is, I need the demographics. I need that enrollment growth and the different patterns of where the growth is happening in order to project for the future. And then finally, it's the educational program. So part of my job was to go and visit the schools, see it in operations during the school day, walk around with the school principals, be told how they're running, what, what impact of, of new programs or new kids that had come in, including special needs uh, students that are taking over some of the classrooms, what impact has that had on taking some of the co-curricular activities, such as art and music, and putting it on a cart? Those are things I needed to see firsthand. I needed to see how the corridors were being used, the passing and circulation of a school, if there were pinch points, if things were less efficient, and what areas we can work on. So those are the three components that I that are really are a filter in terms of taking a look at strategically um, for when we do the planning, when we project what might needs to happen. And the process is probably, again, also makes uh, pretty much a lot of sense in that you start with information gathering. It really is spending time in the district and getting to, to know it. You have the assessment phase. You're going into what I'm going into right now is really the information sharing as well as the innovation, which I think is a concept design. And then you have evaluations, and then we're going to have a lot of outreach and communications. But one of the things I'd ask Heather to con come up here and talk a little bit on the information gathering, because she's been looking at it from the bones of the buildings in terms of the assessments. So looking at both the information gathering as well as the assessments of the facilities and have her talk about the process. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Heather. Um, and as Jean mentioned, I'm really spearheading the facilities assessment, the, the real uh, physical nature of the buildings themselves and the sites. We have three teams in the office that have kind of spread out and visited each one of the schools um, and come back and really entered the data. And uh, we're putting together reports that are going to uh, inform what Jean's doing as far as uh, the long-term educational assessment of the schools. We're going to look at every system within each building the uh, mechanical systems, the finishes, uh, the sites, the roof, the exterior structure. And for each one, we're kind of assigning uh, a condition, either uh, poor, fair, good, or excellent, right? And the poor, which will signify as a bright red color, really indicates that it needs to be addressed right away. Um, and it'll go down from there. Um, and that will help Jean look at what the opportunities are and what efficiencies there are in moving forward and, and, and looking at areas to either expand or to capitalize on uh, opportunities within the schools. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll have that for you guys in a few months, we'll have it all pulled together. I think you have 17 schools, which is a lot to get through, but the staff has been great and everybody made themselves available and let us get into the schools and do what we needed to do, so thank you. I guess it's 19 when you count the early education component, right? It's 17 plus two. And what I want to differentiate a little bit is that you really have two things going on right now. We have a long range facility plan called LRFP, which is a state requirement that every five years, every district is required to put in little bits of pieces of data that, as Heather's saying, that we're collecting in terms of the condition of the roof, when the next re-roofing has to happen, the condition of the floor, the condition of the mechanical ventilation, the condition of the boilers, the starters of the boilers. All that information has to be put in every five years, and a plan has to be done. To, a lot of that work is done through annual budget, through capital maintenance, repairs, and replacements, and renewals. What I'm doing at the same time, so it's really the other component, is what I'm calling the long range facility master plan. So it's not just a facility plan, it's a master plan. And that's where we're really folding in the capacity issues and the educational program issues. So it really is that educational adequacy that gets us the, the emphasis on it. For the state, the state just asks for little bits of data put into a website and you get these kind of reports spewed out that's a lot of numbers. Very informative, but incredibly difficult to look at and grasp and understand what does it mean. My side of the equation is it's all pictures, it's all diagrams, it's all things expressed in a fashion that hopefully can be communicated to the public, to the staff, to the students, to the teachers as to what the needs are and what options there are to do it. So mine is highly illustrative and kind of graphic as opposed to the other part of the, the report. But you get both. This is one's a requirement with a baseline of information and data that has to be inputted and the other is really what we hope to be a living document that really can change and, and more with that. And the reason I say it's a living document is that one of the things that, that we like to have as part of the participation is to make sure that there is a component that really involves a really a broad participation of stakeholders because facilities cost money. So cost money, is whether it's a, something that is done through the budget or it's done through a referendum or it's done through going after some bond money, you know, that Governor Murphy just is going to talk about with security. Maybe it's going after some energy efficiency under energy efficiency bonds for an ESEP program. So there's a couple different pots of money to be looking at. But what we want to be really part and parcel is being directed with community input and helping to set those priorities and really get that information. And so we really want as broad a uh, participation 
as possible. And this is one thing that we talk to the Board of Education because they ultimately have to make the decisions for what gets put before the voters or what gets sent down to the State Department of Education. However, it helps them to make those decisions because some of these are tough decisions when you're looking at priorities and, and studying which one is your highest need and your second need and your third need is having that input from informed um, people. And we hope that this process by doing the diagrams, making it very illustrated, we get a very informed way to, to have a dialogue for that. And this is what we're saying are the needs that we're focusing on right now, literally, as we're collecting this information, that we really are taking a very hard look because the last referendum planning that was done for the district has been, it was 2008 was a big chunk of it and then the numbers went out in 2010, but it's really been 10 plus years since uh, things were looked at. What we really want to do is say that safety, security, and kind of the access equations have changed in 10 years. So this is obviously something that's really risen to the top in terms of taking a hard look at what's happening on those components, just because of the, the climate that's out there in terms of the awareness of the need for heightened security, and obviously the aware of the risk, the greater risk that really our schools are facing um, as, as targets. On the, Growth and, and enrollment, you already know this, you're hearing it again, that yes, the, the growth is continuing in the district, so what you, what you were wrestling with in the past, serving on this committee, is still present, and there's some nuances that have changed, some demographic shifts a little bit over the past 10 years, and that's what I'll be bringing to your attention. But at the same time, the baseline is the kids came, <laughs> the ones that were predicted at, you know, eight years ago, they came and they're here in the district. Now the other needs in terms of you know what had to happen when kids came no referendum, no facilities, things got impacted, programs got impacted because a lot of the things had to go on carts or be shortchanged or curtailed or constricted. And so what we're putting back on the table is going back to what are good facility planning um, standards in terms of having spaces not only for classrooms but also for art, for music, for STEM activities, for science, for robotics, for the things where education is changing, making sure that there's a space that can be really morphed. And, and I say this that I'm very much okay with spaces doing double or triple duty as long as they're well supported. So they have to be adequate in size and they have to be have enough storage and they can be time shared. But when you reach a certain saturation point, you may need a second space or a third space depending on the number of students. And one of the things I'll be doing is really uh, pointing out when a multi-purpose room can handle multiple activities, what size and what's the, the, the dividing line, versus when you're past the tipping point and it no longer can be multi-purpose, but it becomes single purpose because of the capacity and that you need a second multi-purpose space or another collaboration space on the, in the district with that. In addition, so in addition to that, the idea of the shifting to the act of learning, that there's some impact on furnishings that's happening, and uh, technology integration is continuing what the district has really started on the one-to-one -one and the support. And then, of course, the, um, the energy efficiency, which is our baseline, because that's something that, that we do. We, we basically practice green architecture, and we make that a fundamental point for every single school. That's something, again, shifting operational expenses making it proactively can be used for program expenses and not for air, for fuel or for things in running the buildings. And this is the areas of focus as you take those our, our needs into the focus is that what I'm gonna be charged with is really starting number one, the adequate capacity and support for enrollment. That's really gonna be leading the charge in terms of gonna be the most um, impact on the facility needs. In addition to making sure that the roofs are being maintained and, uh, and the plumbing is working in the schools, we gotta make sure you have capacity and adequate capacity. I am gonna still really focus on that safety, security, and circulation, and part of my input tonight when I'm asking for your dialogue is, is to making sure that what I have up here makes sense to you because this is really where my focus is going to be on and if this doesn't make sense to you I want to hear it from you or I want to hear a confirmation that yes absolutely this is what we want you to focus on when you're doing it. 
will be looking at the best use of district land and the existing site resources. I don't know if there are other existing open space options, alternatives. I'll be looking for information from um, the district on that, from the townspeople, from other people that might be involved in the process. There's talk that from Dan has told me a little bit about the past history of land being associated with uh, Camp Kilmer that might be an option. There may be a, a, an old building site that had former school that was used for the community center. If that shifts someplace else, maybe that parcel of land becomes available. So there's some other little components that we're gonna take a look at. I'm not gonna focus on that first. That'll be later coming into it because I'm gonna focus first on the existing sites that the school has and the square footage and the acreage that's available. Look at that in the master plan and what can be built out. And only if that once that is exceeded, I'll be looking for, okay, where else can we build? What else is, else is out there in the town that might be possibilities for it? And then obviously the other components are what we were talking about in terms of the, uh, the learning as well as the um, support for maintenance and operations. And the reason why I say that, I look at the buildings and look for spaces that are existing first and or that might be changed around to see if some of these components that where education is shifting can be accommodated. If they can, we look to renovate or to augment or change the furniture or make it a little bit more um, uh, relevant to 21st century learning. If they don't exist, then we're looking to build or to augment or renovate an existing space with new furnishings and equipment to, to, to do that. But these are the things that will be driving the educational adequacy compart. In addition to capacity, also looking for program support uh, with that. In terms of shared use, the communal space, the multi-purpose space, the spaces that in some of the elementary schools that really can only do single purpose because they've just exceeded the capacity to be to both a cafeteria and a gym. It's just impossible to get the kids cycled in for gym because there's just not enough square footage available for those, those spaces. And to make sure that things that can be done through renovations, you have nice size auditoriums at your high school. Are they the most attractive venues I've seen? No. <laughs> and so some of the things that you can look at in terms of when we're looking at the acoustics, when we're looking at how it's functioning, is to say, you know, you can do some things with lighting, with some paint, with some, you know, just some trim around the things. Things that can work towards the, making the acoustics better can also have a visual impact that can give it a renewal of, of life with that component. Because I know I've been to your high schools and saw some of the arts and theater and drama programs in action. Fabulous. It's like you want to support that. You want to invite the community in. You want those to be active spaces because that's part of the draw of students stay connected to education. They're passionate about those co-curricular activities and they that passion spills over to the education. So that's something you want to support. And media centers. Some of the media centers I saw are shifting towards really collaborative spaces and you can see the ones that have and there's others that are open possibilities. So we saw some potential in the media centers for just some um, furniture and renewal. Outside spaces, the same thing in terms of what can happen in courtyards, what can happen at the entry points, and even in the fields. Uh, a lot of the fields, um, I did realize that you have a lot of wetlands, and a lot of the school sites that were given to the school district in the 60s and 50s were the parcels that were the wettest, <laughs> you know, that the developers kind of donated them. So there's some issues there that, we have, that we're cognizant of, and what the, you know, part of our address would be looking at what can be done over time to address those issues to make it more functional. And again, this is something that we just put in, in terms of whatever we do, it's all about natural daylighting. It's all about you know, really reducing the energy consumption and making it so that the green focus is transparent. We would love the building to be the third teacher, to really make it so that that's part of the curriculum, that there's areas on it for environmental science, there's areas that are they're really having the natural shading of classrooms on the part of the, the sites that can happen with the green focus and well planning. Now it gets into uh, the next phase, and this is the preview because the demographic reports have not been released yet. This is just something that the demographer shared early, so numbers on it, I wanted them to really, really tiny because they may be fluctuating because he's still working out what, on housing developments and what the impact is. But you can see that this is your past five years. On average, you increase 
over 377 students per year, so close to 400 students per year over the five years have been absorbed by the school. When you think of that, that's almost 2,000 students. This is what was predicted back you know, when the first referendums were, were being considered. They came to pass, so those projections at that time were spot on in terms of the kids coming. This is why the facilities are existing are very much pinched. That's really the growth. And you can see, in general, other than 2008, that's a recession dip. It's really been an upward progression. What we're predicting for the next five years is that it's a twofold message. Part of it is that the birth rates are dipping so much. In New Jersey, in the, actually in the United States, really it's, it's just a, a much smaller, um, slower decrease in our birth rates. That will affect some of the population that will be going over the next five years entering the kindergarten. Now, part of that is especially mass because you're half-day kindergarten, and of course the number would change significantly if we look at full-day kindergarten, which is what your peers around have all gone towards. We're gonna be looking at what the impact of full-day kindergarten is. So that's one of the scenarios that we'll be showing. We'll be showing plans with half-day and we'll be showing plans with full-day just so you, we can start to quantify that needs. So those numbers will really be more consistent because the, these projections are taken into account half-day kindergarten, so the projections would be augmented in terms of a sheer number um, in, in terms of the elementary load if it goes to full-day kindergarten, because I'm sure those the gap, the delta between kindergarten and first grade is a couple hundred, it's almost like 300 students across the district. That gap will be much closer. You know, it'll be, you'll feel it in kindergarten as opposed to waiting to first grade when it's a full day scenario. So that's something we'll be looking at. But in general, what we're seeing is that if birth rates are slowing, that can be a little bit of an opportunity for some of the elementary schools to really, you know, have some of their classrooms go for full day kindergarten without having to add every single new one. So that's a, that's a good opportunity. But at the same time, the kids that are in the system already, the ones that entered here, they're now hitting your middle schools and your high schools. And you're gonna see that the focus of a lot of the facility improvements is shifting to the middle schools and the high schools, because that's the, the ones that are gonna be even more hard hit over the next five years. Um, and for the high schools, it's really, it's not only five years, it's really 10 years, because those kids are already in the school system for a high school, they're already there. For a middle school, it's really the next seven years that we can predict, because we know the numbers of the, the kids that'll be moving through the system with that. And so that really is what um, this diagram is suggesting, is that you can see the biggest number being projected is grade six, and that grade six over the next five years just get shifted up to the high schools and on up, up the grade. That, that's the bulge that we're gonna be seeing. It's already here. These are not kids I'm inventing. This is not even, you know, this, you know, there'll be some kids coming from some developments and there'll be some addition net migration in, but these are kids in your system. And some of your middle schools right now have really high class sizes. They have programs happening in the corridors. They have to, and at the high school, some of the AP courses and the special electives have to be closed. They only have one room dedicated. They can only have it eight or nine periods a day. At some point, you basically have to turn students away from accessing some programs because of sheer numbers of classrooms. And so those are things, that we, high school's a little bit more flexible because you have slightly different departments and you have capacity with it. So it's a little bit more flexible in terms of our planning component. But ultimately, when you're looking at facilities for like say science, you still come down to how many science classrooms do you have in the school, how many kids are in there, how many are taking not just one or two years of science, but four years of science. Then you have to do the math and divide it and say, do you have enough science classrooms and lab spaces to accommodate those needs for, for a high achieving uh, district where a lot of kids are going for three, at least three years of science, let alone four years of science and taking AP at that um, as well. So those are the things that we'll be looking at on the capacity that's coming out of the demographic preview. So the only news is that, you know, it really is those upper grades that'll be significantly impacted in addition to the idea of a full day kindergarten with that. And so then just some preliminary findings, I, again, um, you know, that, that we're noting the class sizes when I was walking around. I saw some um, 
some rooms from fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, in which you have the tabular seats because there's no other layout that works within the space and the kids are really packed in there and they basically have to leave the room if they want to work as a group because there's no other space in it. Um, and some of the other classrooms, it, you know, I'm really a proponent of having furniture that moves, that allow a student to move around, but you have to have enough space and you have to have the appropriate class size to have that investment in the furnishings make sense. So I just wanted to point that out uh, where we can do it. You obviously have lost every storage room pretty much in the building because it had to be turned into small group instruction or offices or other space for the administrative. Things that the state has required that weren't in the original design of the building. When they were built in the 1960s and 1950s and some in the 70s, they just didn't factor in the need for that kind of support system. The schools had to find space, so they've uh, co-opted other spaces, jamming up things uh, in tiny spaces. Many of you, if you have elementary children, we are, know that a lot of the food service components happen in the corridors because there are no kitchens in most of the elementary schools. Very few have a full-size kitchen. So you basically have food service and you have kids eating in classrooms because the gym has to be, the multi-purpose room has to be used as a gym full-time. It cannot be taken down or used in the middle of the day. And it also impacts assemblies. It also impacts other components. So assemblies are our kind of program for days that they think are going to be nice weather days so <laughs> the kids can go outside and get their PE in and the assembly can happen in uh, the other times. So those are the creative things that the schools have been doing because of the pinch of classrooms and capacities. Um, so there is really the limitation of space and things going on in carts has affected and impacted programs. So just wanted to say that by not expanding facilities sooner, there has been an impact. The school district has dealt with it, but the impact is getting tougher. It's like they are now literally out of space for what they can find in the building. In terms of the access and improvements, um, I try to be there for, your, for the most part, it was usually dismissal time, was I try to see a dismissal at the school, so I got a sense of what happens when you have the buses and the cars and the circulation and I, you know, and, and you know, things it, just from the perspective of can there be some modifications, can there be some loop roads, can there be some connections to roads that are currently closed off that can ease some of that congestion and improve emergency access because if something were to happen during dismissal time in terms of trying to get an emergency vehicle to some of your schools, it would be impossible. I mean, I know fire trucks will go over you know, pr people's property and things like that and just do what they have to do to get there. But it would be good to see if we can plan and work with the town, work with the township police and get input on the plans for things that might be some modifications that look that can be improved with that. Uh, we have to look at the heightened security places where that might make sense for that, as well as we talked about the um, the storm water. The, this is this is your field. This is what it wants to be <laughs> in terms of you know in terms of getting some of the water drainage off so that you can have more functional fields and, and spaces that are not uh, really literally in, in the swamp um, component. And the last thing I wanted to talk before I kind of open it up is this idea of uh, planning timelines. So really just leading you through the, um, the schedule right now is that we started in October and pretty much went to all the buildings between October and November and really had all our building tours and doing the, the analysis. So what we're entering now is a period where I'm taking all that information, making my diagrams, Heather's doing her charts and putting those components out. So that's really what's gonna happen in December and January. We're gonna have that quantification, those the assessments, those analysis, the diagrams that we're talking about that'll lead to um, lively discussions, I'm sure. And at the same time, we'll be receiving right about here is a demographic report. So that will really kind of help with the quantifications of the needs. This is the component I really wanted to emphasize when I was showing that slide about all the stakeholders and the community input. I'm just throwing out some dates. This process might be shorter, might be longer. I don't know how long it'll take. It's, it, I'm showing it in red as just a flexible component. But in terms of having that input based on the results, whether um, the scenarios and options that we present start to, to um, resonate with people, start to get people saying, well, this makes a lot of sense to me. Yes, I agree that these are our top priority needs. 
what we really want to do is kind of build a consensus for what the district um, wants to do stepping forward with ideas and options and information being presented along with it. And then at that point, when that process is done, and I'm being flexible on the timing, then we would finish the long range data because we, we have to do the data input. Some of the data input doesn't change, like when the age of the roof and when it's needs, that can be input at any time. But in terms of expansion ideas or where it's gonna expand, I want that to happen at the end of a process that includes community input. Um, so that really is the last component. And then at that point, it shifts back to the Board of Education in terms of making the tough decisions as to how they want to look at what financing options are out there. How do you split the pie? If there's a lot of mechanical needs and electrical needs, can some of that work not be done in a referendum, but be done through energy saving improvement bonds? So that could be something that's taken out of the plate of a taxpayer's burden, and that's being done where the utility come, you, you keep paying your utility bills, and part of your payment of your utility bills pays for the improvements of getting the new LED lights, of getting new, the inner workings of unit vents being renewed and refreshed with it, getting some of your plumbing fixtures with uh, kind of low flow plumbing improvements being done so you have water conservation. Those are things that can be taken off of a referendum and put in another pot. We'll be looking at that. Looking at, uh, I know uh, Paul Saxon's been working on the security component, already looking at ways to improve security. So getting input with, um, you know, having professional information coming in and professional expertise in terms of how best, if you're going to enhance the security, where do you start, where do you put your investment in, and what plan do you have? And we'll reflect that into the long-range plan with, with the security component with that. And at this point, we're going to, you know, I'm just putting a star now towards the, you know, by the end of this school year, that the district really is in good shape for moving forward with a strategy that takes action. And that action can include a referendum, and the whole idea is, and then it goes down through state approvals and process and things like that. And there's a timeline with that. I didn't want to get too far ahead of that, but I, if you if somebody asks a question, I can kind of explain a little bit more what happens after a long-range plan is done and and uh, um, and things are decided upon. But with that, I just wanted to, I guess, pause here and then open it up for questions. And if there's anything I didn't clarify, I can talk a little bit more. You can tell I could I could talk all night. In fact, one of the things I got to do today was talk to the school principals. I really showed them this report. And for them, I was, you know, I was just flashing a few little diagrams saying these are the kind of things that we'll be giving to the school principals. Diagrams that show when the different wings were built. Because that has a real impact on both when things have to be renewed as well as what are characteristics of 1950 design. Why is it there's no you know, toilets in this wing? Well, that's how they were built. Or why is it the, the heating or the cooling system works this way? That's age related. So those are that's a bit of information. We have diagrams that look at capacities. When I do my capacities, I'll be color coding the diagrams that show what's a classroom, what's a resource room, what's a, um, a you know administrative space. So again, they'll have information that that looks at that, and that's how I do my math and, and calculations with that. We'll have diagrams that look at the individual sites that basically look at options for building out in the future and having diagrams and showing ways that we can improve the, the circulation. And there will be diagrams that, um, I don't know if you can see this, but one of the things that's online are uh, wetlands. So the, the, I don't know if there's a little bit of bright blue in there. You can see where wetlands exist right now close to school sites. Some it's practically wrapping all around the school, and the school is like the one little island in a whole sea of wetlands. But those are information that we want to have and share, again, pictorially, so it's very easy to comprehend, and it's just additional information that the staff and administration will have. Right. Yep. You can turn this one on, and I'll pass it around. Great. All right, questions. I'll give the mic, and you can pass it around. Any questions? Mm. Oh, here we go. I think one of the things also to look at is the health offices in all of the, I'm a nurse in the district, and I have been to every um, school's health office, and many of them are extremely small and do not meet the needs um, for confidentiality or anything. There's no private space to take the children to, and they're really too small for the amount of students you're seeing at any given time. And one of the things I can um, do in, for the master plan report is show what is a um, 
the facility efficiency standards, like what is a good size nurse's suite, and compare and say, okay, this one is 310 square feet, and they're saying the minimum for a school of this size and, and capacity should be 550 square feet. You can see immediately that's where the missing space is for, you know, in terms of that. Exactly. That, that we're definitely catching. And several that are too mm -hmm. far away from the main office. And if you're alone, mm -hmm. it's very hard when mm -hmm. you need that extra set of hands or something. Absolutely. No. I, I, we will definitely be looking at spaces to renovate. Um, in fact, I, 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 it was always a joy to go into there's a couple, one or two, that I came into and said, oh, this is like a normal size <laughs> nurse's office, because most of them, especially in the elementary schools, were all too small. Yeah. I have a couple of questions, sorry. Uh, would you also be looking at the sidewalks, the condition of the sidewalks around the schools? I must say that um, the school principals in particular made sure that even though I was looking at educational capacities, they wanted me to see that. So I know firsthand there are things I came back to Heather and said, Heather, did you see this area? That Because that is a minor repair that can be done in a capital things, but what has to be done is to say, this is important. This is a high priority because this is all about access to the school. It's about safety. It's about basically it's something that has to be addressed. So what our report gets to do is put it as a high priority. And it, it's, it's, it gets to the, the point that we can now shift some things and bring it to the attention of board members and say, these are things that need to really rise up because this in particular you, has to be um, a component that, that's looked at. We also wanted to look at um, sidewalks. There's a lot of sidewalks that are very narrow so that when they're doing fire drills or evacuation, and because it's so wet and swampy on either side, it you know it, it's not a high hazard because you could walk on the grass as you had to, but the whole idea is to widen some of the sidewalks. If you're being repaired or the, a new path is being laid, is to make sure that they're wide enough. Uh, will you look at the safety in the school capacity, especially in the hallways when changing classrooms? Absolutely. That's something that, uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to be there during the school day. And, and I, I told the principals to show me the pinch points. And there were times when I literally was like this, <laughs> you know, just my back was up there because they have so few minutes to pass in between the classes and, it, you know, it's, that and stairwells. Some of the stairwells in the buildings are very, very narrow. So it's something was we were just aware of. Um, not that you can change that, but part of it was really helping the, the school principal to rethink, you know, some strategies for what might be an up, what might be a down, what might make it um, better in terms of circulation. So we'll definitely take a look at that. Uh, looking at the water quality in the schools. Water qualities, I know Dan has to do testing, right? I think the testing is re required. And one of the things we want to do is capture the test results and find out which are the old water fountains, which are the new ones, where are the locations. Because what we want to do is that, say, it, a, a wing or something is being renovated for some other educational reason, that might be an excellent time to get that water fountain changed out or if, if it's on a plan that shows that these toilets need to be renovated. And I include not only water fountains but also toilet rooms because toilet rooms and the age of plumbing and the, um, and the ventilation basically has a life cycle to it. You know, there, at some point, you know, you're basically repairing sinks and, and, um, and faucets and component parts so much that you start to lose the actual functionality of them. So we're going to be suggesting that as part of the long-range plan that you have toilet renovations and improvements, and that includes the drinking fountains. Last one. Oh, would you also include air conditioning recommendations? One of the things that, that we'll take a look at is, is that because and we would love to see how much of an ESIP program might be able to buy some air conditioning components because when you replace a rooftop HVAC system, say some of the, the multi-purpose rooms or some of the other bigger spaces, the newer systems are not only more energy efficient, but they come with air conditioning. So that's something that basically you can get a gain of air conditioning under some of the renewals that have to happen of aging equipment that have reached the end of their life cycle. At the same time, we also want to be very much made aware, and, and the school principals were good at pointing out, and I'm sure the custodians were doing the same, certain wings and certain buildings have greater heat buildup than others, so we wanted to make sure that that 
factored in into our priority orders to say which ones are, are so uncomfortable or so out of bounds of the thermal comfort that this, if, when you start with air conditioning, even if you have to do it over time and do it in different pieces, this is where you should start. So we'll be looking at that. Anyone else? Ms. Conway. Uh, in your planning, will you have alternatives? Like, for instance, they talk uh, mainly about the lack of space in the township in order to build new schools or expand the existing schools. Will there be alternatives? You could either do this or you could do that. Or are you just set on what would be the best situation to take into consideration? We'll have multiple options. Um, my concentration will be on district lands because I don't have information on other parcels of development. One of the things I'll be doing is asking the question during the process, are there other alternatives outside of what the district owns as property to be put up? Because hopefully if we do have the mayor, the council people, people from the planning board involved in this participation, they're gonna have information, and I hope it's a really two-way street with a dialogue to find out if there's any other alternatives that can be raised through this process. I myself, you know, I'm really gonna first concentrate on what can be done for district lands, district facilities, and make sure that I'm showing the options and multiple options for what the district can control moving forward, and then open the floor up and try and get the questions for alternatives. And if there's an alternative that's, that really catches fire, um, we're gonna respond to that. You know, that, I'm not saying no to that, because I'm saying if it starts to make sense and this would be, this really solves a problem if we're looking at early education centers that might want to work in the south and, and in the north, and there's a parcel of land that we could develop something, then that might be really a, an opportunity, you know, a good opportunity for the, the, the township and the school district. Anyone else? Okay. Well, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd also like to thank that you mentioned now our town fathers. Uh, Councilman Deal is here, who is also part of the council and is a big part of helping us with anything we do in the schools, but also is a big part of trying to find us property, if any, is available. So I'd like to recognize Mr. Deal. Thank you for coming out. I should have let you answer that class question. Yeah, right. <laughs> and again, th thank you for everyone for coming out tonight. And uh, more information to come. We'll keep you posted. Uh, we'll keep everything updated. This presentation will be on the web page, I'm sure, and within the next day or two. And again, thank you for everyone coming out, and we look forward to solving our overcrowding problem. Thank you. <laughs>